maybe we'll talk about all the different ways that we can replace testosterone. Sure. So the three ways that we have historically done it in our practice, I guess technically four, um, one is, and we don't do this anymore, um, we used to use clomiphene. Mm -hmm. So we would give clomid. It had the advantage of several things. One, it's uh, it's a pill. Very convenient. Yep. Take it three times a week. Uh, two, it preserved uh, function, meaning sure. you you preserved both testicular volume and spermatic function. Mm -hmm. uh, so you preserved fertility. Um, and actually, it was quite efficacious. Yeah. I found it to be because you could titrate the dose and get to almost whatever you mean. The drawback is if the man didn't have testicular reserve, mm -hmm. uh, he wasn't going to get much of a bump. Sure. So, so, you know, there were some guys who had kind of peripheral hypogonadism as mm -hmm. opposed to central. This was a great treatment for central, but you were at the limit of what the testes could do. There were reasons we ended up stopping it that I won't necessarily get into, but we basically haven't used that in a very long time. We then would use as the alternative to that HCG. Mm -hmm. HCG is just a mimetic for LH, luteinizing hormone, which you talked about, of course, is the direct stimulant of the Leydig cell, which makes testosterone. Uh, lots of disadvantages. It's pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. It's an injectable. It's a very delicate injectable, so it has to be refrigerated. If you drop the bottle, the protein mm -hmm. misfolds, and it's, it's crap. Mm -hmm. So lots of problems associated with it. But again, seems to preserve testicular volume, which young men care about. Uh, maybe older men do too as well. Um, not clear if it's as good as Clomid at preserving fertility. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear your sure. opinion on that. Um, but again, it feels less problematic mm -hmm. to men in the sense that it's less permanent. Sure. Of course, we then use the mainstay as injectable testosterone cypionate mm -hmm. uh, or its derivatives. Um, and again, we'll talk sure. about all the pros and cons of that. And then lastly, pellets. Right. So testosterone pellets injected. Don't do that anymore now that we've switched to being more of a remote practice. So I don't see patients in person to in, to put the pellets in them. Sure. Um, and also for men, pellets are a much bigger deal than for women. The pellets sure. are so much bigger. Sure. Uh, for women, when you're putting little estrogen and testosterone pellets in it, they're, it's, a, sure. it's a walk in the park. They don't even notice you've done it. I, for men, they notice it. Sure. Great topic. So this is really important. So you talked about two. So let's talk about endogenous ways to raise testosterone yep. first. And you can use clone. You can use HCG. Some people use anastrozole. I don't recommend that, but we'll talk about that. So Clomid first. It's a serum, negative feedback to the estrogen receptor. The problem with Clomid is the following. We get a discrepancy effect, and this is what happens. You get a very nice bump in the testosterone level. That's true. But roughly 40% of patients say, I have no desire for sex. I have no erections. I don't feel any desire. Because the way the Clomid works, it blocks estrogen receptor centrally. Men need, need estrogen. estrogen. It is Absolutely. critical. You need estrogen for libido and sexual function. So they have these beautiful 800, 900 levels. No and desire for sex. No desire. You take that same patient, put him on exogenous testosterone at 800. He says it's working. So the way Clomid works is that it blocks. And so that mechanism is not conducive for many men. Yes, it's easy. There's a national backorder. So now we're starting to use a little bit more N Clomid. Is N Clomid legal in the US? Uh, it is compounded. Yep. Remember, repro and try to get it through in 2015 at the FDA never made it through. Yep. But it was, uh, it's, you know, it's the trans isomer of clomid yep. and so uh, of uh, azuclomid. So, and essentially it is available compounded and you can get it, but it's hard to get clomid now even because there's a, a national back order. And, and th is this just due to all these tea shops opening up on every corner that are? Well, they're different. So they're more into giving the tea and the injection and you come in and get the injection for a fee. Okay. But this still is on the endogenous side. If clomid's not bad. I mean, it, But why, why is there such a run on this stuff? Because what happened was HCG was for many years compounded. And l recently, uh, the FDA has said that HCG cannot be compounded. So everyone dropped the HCG and went to Clomid. And now there's a mad rush to get the Clomid. You can still get HCG uh, commercially, yeah, but the price is through the roof. The pregnant, yeah, but it's yeah, through the yeah, roof. Yeah, so, it's so what happened was that everyone started going to Clomid. And so now we're back ordered on Clomid and you can still get HCG, but it's pricey. And did the FDA say no more compounding HCG because it's too complicated and they couldn't do quality assurance? Uh, I think it was a patent infringement. I think it was more to the fact that I think Merck still had uh, rights to the patent on HCG and it was too similar because a compounder can make something, but it has to be different. That's my understanding. So I, I, I for some reason, our yeah. compounder, you know, so I think certain, comp I think it's going to start coming back, but there was a national shortage on HCG and that's why people started going to Clomid. But Clomid, it's, it's not 
The 60% will say my T goes up. You got to give it every other day or you can get a tachyphylaxis. So 7% can get tachyphylaxis if you give it daily. Some patients, for, I say, they say, I can't remember every other day. I say, fine, take it every day. And there's a 7% chance you may become resistant to the drug. 7%. 7%. Yeah. Okay, so that's fine. We uh, taught people to get a pill box when we used to use it. Yeah. So it was just Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and don't have to think about it. Right. We load the but pill box. If you forget, take it every day. And like n -clomid, we give it every day. And what doses do you use? Uh, uh, 50 for Clomid every yep. other day or n -clomid 20 a day, yep. right? Or if they forget on 50 every other day, we use 25 Clomid daily. Okay, fine. It's not a great, but it does help. We use it for fertility. So patients who are coming to me for fertility to help them achieve a, a pregnancy, yep. we use it. You can use HCG. HCG is expensive and it is pricey. Uh, typically, it depends on what dose you want to use. Um, but it, it's 1,500 three times a week, up to 2,000 three times a week. It can be effective. It's nice for patients who have pituitary pathology because I bypass the pituitary, yep. go straight to the testicle, and it can start making testosterone. And then in patients who have an elevated LH and FSH Initially, Kleinfelters. Yes, you can't really use HCG or Clomid because the way Clomid they're works, already maxed they're already out. maxed out. So you've yep. got to use Nasrazole, or because I'm trying to increase the T to E ratio, increase the T. And typically, I'm using this medication to improve spermatogenesis so that I can then do a biopsy or a tessie to achieve sperm. And how I've never seen a man with Klein, I've never seen a man with Kleinfelters. If when a man presents with Kleinfelters, what are his typical T, DHT, and E levels? They're, so the E's are typically high. The T's are pretty typically how very high low. are the E's? Uh, 40, 30. Oh, so you not know, that high. They're not super high, but they are. And it depends on how far along you see them along the way. FSH and LH are typically already elevated, pretty high. So if the FSH and LH are already elevated, I can't use Clomid or HCG, right? So What's I the prevalence of Kleinfelters? Uh, one in five hundred. So it's quite common. Really, one, that high? XX, yes. Just tell people what Kleinfelters uh, is. It's a genetic abnormality where you have an extra X chromosome, XXY. So phenotypically, you're a man. Phenotypically, you're a man, but there are issues. Infertility, you can have gynecomastia. Uh, they're typically long stature in nature. Um, normal, you can live- They have normal, normal sexual function? Uh, they have no issues with ED, but the T is low, so that may affect the ED. So, but we treat these men with medications to raise the T, right? And so we see them- And why can't you just give them testosterone? Uh, we can, but it, what if they want to have a child, right? Yeah. So, so that's the only thing. So what we may do is I see a lot of these patients when they're 14 or 15 when they're first diagnosed. So we have the- How are they usually diagnosed? I mean, I know the diagnosis is genetic, but what brings them to presentation? A lot of times what you'll see is that there's no facial hair development. So there's a delay in development. I right? see. No shaving. And so what you'll notice, and so the, and if there's a suspicion, long stature, uh, small testicles on exam, the pediatrician may say, let me just check a karyotype yep. and just see what's happening. And then you see two X chromosomes. And then you know. Yep. You know, so it's-, so it's One in 500. That means- there's a lot of people listening to this podcast yeah. that have Kleinfelters. Presumably they know it, but they may not. They might. And if they know it, they might be wondering, is testosterone an option? And what you're saying is not necessarily first line unless you can block estrogen as well. Right. And, and of course, that, it depends on the fertility status. Right. And some of these patients will start testosterone. And then when they're ready to have children, we will do a procedure called a micro tessie at that time. And what we'll do is we'll stop the testosterone. And so my reversal dose is HCG, 3,000 units, three times a week. And then we'll either give them gonal F or Clomid with it. So it, there's three ways to look at it. There's yeah. patients who've taken testosterone and they're abusers. And they've come in now and they want to have children. That's the type number one of patients. That patient stops the testosterone, HCG, 3,000 units, three times a week, plus uh, recombinant FSH or gonal F, 75 units three times a week. And that actually does help reverse. Anywhere from three to seven months, you can see recovery of spermatogenesis in these patients who are azospermic. So that's great, okay? And tell me, that guy shows up having been on testosterone for how long to be in Maybe years. And, and and many times they may have gotten the testosterone from a gym or something and they didn't, weren't getting monitored and they're at super physiologic levels. So this is how long have you been on it and how high was your dose it dictates yep. how far along, you know, so, so for we years. We tell patients that, and we use physiologic doses. So a typical dose for us is 50 milligrams of cypionate twice a week. That's what we do. Yeah. Okay. So, so we would say at physiologic dose, you don't want to be on this for more than two years. And we are really hyper vigilant and say, I wouldn't be on this for more than a year unless you're willing to be on it. Yeah. And what, what do you say? So typically it depends on, you're talking about younger patients though? Yeah. So someone who's like in his 40s. Right. So in his 40s, I still try to, the second, so the category two is a young man who just wants to use HCG alone. Mm -hmm. And that's not 3,000 three times a week. That's 1,500 yep. three times a week as a, as a dose. 
And then there's the last one, and this is a study that we did at Baylor, where there's a patient who wants to take tea and we give them HCG with it to protect the access. Yep. And that's 500, three times. So 500, 1,500, 3,000. There's three different patients. Yep. The preservation of, t- you know, and this and also preserves access. is the 500 of HCG three times a week, it's not doing anything to boost endogenous production. Protection. It's just protection. And the best study, this is the best study came out, is a guy named Coviella. This is how we got the idea at Baylor. Coviella had a study in 2005 where he gave patients 200 milligrams of testosterone IM every week. Okay. That's a big dose. Big dose every week. And what he was measuring was intratesticular testosterone levels. And at 200 IM every week, the intratesticular went down. 94% of patients were down to zero in three weeks. So that's a good number to remember. Wow. 94% decline in intratesticular testosterone in just in three, three weeks. weeks. 94% decline. Then what he did was he gave these patients different doses of HCG, 250, 500, all the way, 1,000. And what he found was between 250 and definitely 500, there was no significant decline in intratesticular testosterone. Very interesting. So he's giving 500 every other. So in 2013. That's amazing. 2013, my partner, Larry Lipschultz, uh, said, okay, if that's true for intratesticular testosterone, what is it doing for fertility? Yeah. So let's do the same thing. Let's give these patients testosterone and 500 units of HCG every other day. And what we saw was there was a decline, but it wasn't a significant decline. And now that was the median. So there are patients who can have, I don't want people to think, hey, if I do this, it's completely safe, but it does help protect decrease in somatogenesis. But why is that the case, given that HCG is acting on the Leydig cell? You would think you would need recombinant FSH to get the protection of spermogenesis. Right, because it has some FSH properties. If you give a man for fertility just HCG, you actually see some improvements in spermatogenesis. Now, there is some of the fact that some of the testosterone is being used by the Sertoli cells for production of sperm production. Would you, has someone done the study of giving clomiphene or emclonophene with testosterone to maintain sperm production? I have not seen that study, but people do it off-label. Yeah, and, they and it do, would seem to me that yeah, that would be even more efficacious. Yeah, people do it off-label. The only issue is that you got now two things working in opposite directions. Because you got the estrogen yeah, problem right? on top. Yeah, and also that you know that the, when you're giving the T, you're suppressing the LH and FSH, yeah. and Clomid's trying to raise the SLH, right? So, but, giving, but giving recombinant FSH would be the better thing to do there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how expensive is recombinant FSH? Extremely expensive. So I would say public- It's really only used for fertility, right? Yes. That's its on-label yes. use is in yes. fertility with women. Yeah, up to $500 a month. I mean, it's very expensive. Wow. Yeah. This is insanely expensive yeah. proposition once yeah. you start going. And what does HCG cost? It depends now because now you can't get a compound. No, if you're getting pregnant uh, uh, branded- About 300 to $300 a month. Insane. Yeah. Yeah. These are, you know, these are, you can understand why, unfortunately, men- especially younger men who might not have the disposable income are basically just getting testosterone because right. it's very cheap. Uh, and especially if they're, you know, getting it in an illicit fashion. Yeah. Uh, so, so you're, you're keeping them out of the doctor's office where they can't be monitored and you're pushing them into the gym locker room yes. where God only knows what they're getting. There's one thing I forgot to mention on the fertility preservation side, besides the anastrozole, clomiphene, and HCG, there is some data that just came out suggesting that the intranasal testosterone does not significantly suppress spermatogenesis. And this was interesting. So it's done three times a day. This was out of the a group at a University of Miami. Three times a day. That's how, yeah, it's called Natesto. It's commercially available. You go to Walgreens, you can buy it. I, I've never even heard of this. I'm, I was just about to ask you about the oral testosterone. Yeah, yeah. We'll so Natesto is a nasal testosterone that's implied, it's 11 uh, milligrams, it's applied e- e- in each nostril, and you do it three times a day. Uh, and essentially what happens is it has the fastest rapid on- onset, uh, and then it declines. And I always thought when 11 I- 11 lo- milligrams TID. So 33 milligrams daily. Right? So in other words, the bioavailability is much lower than an injection. Yes, but the interesting thing is this. I thought, look, if I looked at, I looked at the pharmacokinetics, I said, how can this be effective? Like how it's in and out so yeah. quickly, right? And then, you know, doing some deeper work and talking to some endocrinologists said, look, Mo, you don't have to have it around. If it's bound to the receptor and it's doing its work, it doesn't have to physiologically be there all the time in the serum. And it's interesting, these patients do feel better, right? They feel better. And because of the rapid onset, some of them do say they take it before sex, they take it before a workout because it's very quick. They say they feel better when they take it. This is, how has this not become the drug of choice? (laughs) but no significant suppression in spermatogenesis. That was interesting. Now, more wow. studies need to be done. 
but that was when was this approved? Uh, the Tesla, I think, has been out for at least six or seven years. It's been it's been for a while. Is it inhib- is it cost prohibitive? Uh, it's it, it, it you, insurance does cover it. Uh, it can also be compounded, but um, it's used by a lot of young men. 